Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, you know, earlier when we were worshiping, I kind of thought this is kind of hard to clap and sing at the same time. I'm a little challenged when it comes to music, but it, I think some of y'all did a good job. I think we're going to have to practice that a little bit more. Like, I'll need practice just as much as you'll need practice. I think kids are dismissed to kids' church at this time. Let's go to Lord in prayer uh, before we go into his word. Father, we thank you for your grace, God, and, and, and your, your love towards us. And we, we come before you and we ask that you speak to us about that grace and love and your word. God, that you would show us your truth. Uh, Father, that we would be attentive and ready to hear what you have to say to us. And then, Lord, we would be doers of the word as well. Help us to leave changed. Help us to put action to our faith. And God, help us to give you the glory for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 is where we'll be today. As you're turning there, think of one major role player in the Christmas story. When I'm talking about the Christmas story, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about the Christmas story out of the Bible. Uh, you know, Jesus comes, God comes in the flesh, and uh, Mary is, is pregnant, and, uh, and she gives birth to Jesus. When you think about that Christmas story, who do you think of? Now think about that person. Pick anybody in the Christmas story. You got it in your head? All right, how many of you guys said Jesus? Well, everybody look at the spiritual ones. All right, I'm just, just joking. How about King Herod? Obscure, right? Anybody, anybody think of King Herod? No? How about Mary? Okay, a couple of Marys. How about Joseph? All right. Um, anybody else? Anybody got any they just want to shout out that I might have not talked about? How about the Magi? Anybody think about the Magi? Shepherds? Okay. A lot of different people involved in the Christmas story, right? And we talk about them a lot, mainly when Christmas comes around. If you go to church at all, if you go to church anywhere, you go to church here, you're probably going to hear about Christ. Uh, you're going to hear about the birth of Christ. Sometimes you might hear about Joseph. Sometimes you might hear about Mary. Sometimes you might hear about, you know, the Magi, King Herod, all those people that we talked about. Today I want to talk about somebody that we often leave out of Christmas. So look at Matthew chapter 1 and look at verse 18. It'll be on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. How many of you guys have heard that verse before? What did I do there? What did I do there? I got a little scared in preparing this message, because you know how the Bible talks about, you know, you don't add to the Bible and you don't take away from the Bible? I left something off of that verse. I left out a very important clip of that verse, and the very last part of the verse says this. By the Holy Spirit. Why do we do that? Why, during Christmas time, do we forget about the Holy Spirit? Why is that a microcosm for most Christians' life, including myself? Sometimes we forget about the Holy Spirit and His role at Christmas time, and not only at Christmas time, but man, 365 days a year, as Christians, we give praise to Jesus, we think about God the Father a lot, but man, many times we forget about the Holy Spirit, don't we? I can't be the only one guilty of this. I just, I just, I don't do it intentionally. I don't do it maliciously, but, but we kind of just leave him out. But there he is, right smack dab in the middle of the Christmas story. In verse 20, it says the same thing at the very end. It says, for the child who has been conceived in her is what? Of the Holy Spirit. We do that. We ignore sometimes. We forget the Holy Spirit. We leave him out of the Christmas story. So this morning... I want you to follow me to a few passages. We're going to jump around to a few passages, and we're going to look uh, at these passages, and I want, I want this to be the big idea. Like I said, if, if you don't get anything else from this service, I pray that you would get this thought. You've got to give a life to get a life. You've got to give a life, and I'm not talking about you know, sacrificing someone else's life. You've got to give a life okay, to get a life. And we're going to look at that this morning. So I want to start with, with laying some theological foundation. And all that simply means is it's big words for saying we've got to know that we can know this. All right? We've got to know that we can trust this. And the first place I want us to stop is, is right here in Matthew 1.18. And it says this about the Holy Spirit, that he was the one that did this work in the Virgin Mary. He is to get credit 
for the birth of Jesus, for, for the impregnation of, the, of, of Mary. The Holy Spirit is responsible for doing that work. And, uh, and I want us to just stop there for a moment, and we're going to go through a couple other scriptures, but, but I want us to understand this point, and you might want to write it in your notes. The Holy Spirit gave life at the Incarnation. The Holy Spirit gave life at the Incarnation. The virgin birth does not happen without the Holy Spirit. Now, this is going to be kind of different and, and maybe even a little scary for some of you guys because you're like, Ugh, that sounds weird, that, that sounds abnormal, I, I don't like it, it doesn't make me comfortable. But the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit was the one responsible. You see, we have no Christmas, no Christ child without the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three in one. They have different functions, they have different uh, 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 ways that they reveal themselves to man, and, and here we see the Holy Spirit in this passage, and, and my thought is if the Holy Spirit can give physical life in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, can't he bring abundant spiritual life to you and to me this Christmas? He can. Flip over back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. That's not going to be on the screen, I don't believe, so go ahead and flip there. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 1 and 2. It says this. Most of you know this by heart. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. I want you to see that the Holy Spirit was at creation. Now flip over, if you will. I know you just got there. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And I want to look at verses 12 and 13. If you can't get there in time, just listen. The Holy Spirit is in this passage as well. He's at the beginning of creation. And this is what this, is what this verse says. In verse number, starting in verse number 12 of Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span? And calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. It's saying, who has made, who has made all the things that we can see physically on this earth? The hills, the mountains, the valleys, the water, the oceans, all those things. And in verse 13, it says, who has directed the what? The spirit of the Lord or, or has, or as his counselor has informed him. It's talking about God, the father, but how did he accomplish it? He accomplished it by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit moving at creation. Point number one, if you have notes there, is the Holy Spirit gave life at the incarnation. The next line is the Holy Spirit gave life at creation. You have to understand, this is, this is important because it's like this. If somebody said to you, I want to give you a billion dollars, Joe. What would you want to maybe know? Okay, reason. And he would probably also want to know, do you have it? Are you capable of giving me a billion dollars? Because I don't know, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that has a billion dollars. And if somebody comes to me and says, I, I want to give you a billion dollars, I want to say, have you ever given anybody else a billion dollars? Do you have it in your bank account? Let me see your track record. Where is it? You know, and, and so that's what I want to do this morning with the Holy Spirit. I, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit can give you a powerful, just abundant grace-filled, amazing life that can conquer your sins, can put to death the sins of the flesh, that can bring life to you to where people look on and say, man, that person is doing something different. That person is living a, an amazing life. They're, they're doing things. You can tell the Lord is with them. And the reason we, we need to understand this is we need to first know that the Holy Spirit can give us, can give us this spiritual power. We got to see that he, he's done it before. He's done it in scriptures. He's done it for other people. The promises to you and to me as well. The Holy Spirit gave life at the incarnation. The Holy Spirit gave life at creation. If the Holy Spirit can give life to the natural world, to the physical world, if he can give life at the beginning of creation, we should have confidence that he can bring about spiritual life to you and to me. Now flip over to Romans. We're going to stick in Romans for a little bit. Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8, and we're going to look at verse 11. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says this, But if the Spirit of Him, who's that? The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit has raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, He who raised Christ, from Je- Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit gave life at the resurrection. The Holy Spirit gave life at the incarnation. The Holy Spirit gave life at creation. And the Holy Spirit gave life at the resurrection, you, th- you, you say, well, I've read verses that say Jesus wrote, wrote, you know, he, he raised himself, and that's true. And then you read verses that say, God the Father ha- raised Jesus from the dead, and, and that's true. And then you read a verse that says the Holy Spirit was the one that gave the power to raise Jesus from the dead, and that's true. You see, the three are one, and they work together to do these things, and, he, and, and we, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit was the one that gave the power to raise Christ from the dead. The verse says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. The spirit of who? The spirit of God. The Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. That should be comforting to you. You should have confidence knowing that Christ was risen from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. You should have comfort and and understanding that that the Spirit was at creation and and formed some of the things at creation and was involved at the beginning of creation. You should have comfort knowing that at Christmas time you can remember that the Holy Spirit was involved in a a key figure and one of the key figures in the birth of Jesus Christ and the conception of Jesus Christ. He's given life before. He's done it. Done deal. Like the man with a billion dollars. Now you can say, oh, okay. He can do it. I've seen it. I I know he can do it. If we know that the Holy Spirit can give life to the crucified body of Jesus Christ, we should have confidence that he can bring abundant spiritual life to our lives. Romans 8, 11, the second part, says this. It says, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit gives life to the believer. If you're taking notes, that's the last, that's the last solid foundational point I want to make to you. The Holy Spirit gives life to the believer. He dwells in you. If the spirit of Christ dwells in you, the spirit of, uh, of God who raised Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, you have access to that same power, okay? Everybody, everybody got that? Everybody got that foundation? You know something now, right? You know that the Holy Spirit has the power to bring life. That's a knowledge that you have, whether you want it or not. It's like telling you, don't think about a pink elephant, and everybody immediately thinks about a pink elephant, all right? I'm telling you, you have the power. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you trusted in Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You know that now. You have that same power that was at creation, that was at the incarnation, that was at the resurrection. You have the power of the Holy Spirit within you. But how do we allow the Holy Spirit to give us new life? How do we do that? Because really, we could sit here and we can know a lot of things, right? But the important thing is to to not just know, not just have a head knowledge, but to be able to put action steps to what we know, to carry it out, to flesh it out, to to understand how to actually put it into action. And so that's what I want to focus on this morning. I gave you the foundation. You should know now that the Holy Spirit has the power to bring spiritual life. And now we're going to look at how we actually do that. How do we allow the Holy Spirit to give us a new life? Number one, you must have the Holy Spirit. Seems simple enough, right? You must actually have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and and, and verse 5 through 9. Just read this with me real quick. Romans 8 verse 5 says this, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. In verse 6 of chapter 8. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now listen to this. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ indwelt in you, you don't have Christ. Not only do you not have Christ, you, not have, you do not have God the Father. You do not have a relationship with God. You might think you have a relationship with God, but without the Holy Spirit within you, you don't have a relationship with God. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So how do we, 
How do we respond to that? Most of us, I think, in here have responded to that at some point in time, and it's by simply pl- placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, right? It- it's trusting in Jesus, trusting in what he did on the cross. What did he do on the cross? He paid for your sin. He took upon him your sin that you couldn't pay. As many good works as you want to do, it would never be enough to satisfy God because God is perfect. God is holy. He requires perfection. He requires holiness. So in order to have a relationship with God, that must be rectified. Our our payment must be paid. Like if you went before a judge and the judge said, you're guilty. And you said, I have no way to pay that $1 billion fine. And someone stepped in and said, I'll pay it for him. That's what Christ did for you and for me for our sin. But we must appropriate that. We must trust in Christ. We must say, yes, I I believe that. I trust him in in him. I, I understand that he died on the cross for my sin. And not only did he die on the cross, but he conquered death by raising himself from the grave. It's faith, right? You're saying, I know this, Dave, I know, but just stick with me. Acts 2.38 says this, and it's Peter's talking. He says, he says to them, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and what? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the question should be, how in the world do I repent? Man, that's so simple. That's so simple. You simply turn away from, from, from the thinking that you used to have, from the actions you used to, to do, and, and you say, you know what, that's not good enough. I'm, I'm a sinner. I know I am, just like everybody else. And I don't want that anymore. I know I can't earn my way to heaven, and I'm turning to Jesus Christ. I believe who he said he was. I believe he did what he said he did. And I believe he died on the cross and rose from the grave for me. That's repentance. It's simple. It was, it was very difficult for Christ. He had to go through so much, but, but it's simple for you and for me. So that's the first thing. You must have the Holy Spirit. You think about the culture back then. Anybody know what was going on at Pentecost? You have, anybody know what was going on when, when Peter said in Acts 2.38, he said, Peter said to them, repent. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the crowd. He's talking to the people there that had come. And, and he says to them, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want us to understand is that these were Jewish men mostly. Uh, they had come from different places, but a lot of Jewish people there. And if you said, you know what, I repent, and you're baptized in the name of Christ, you're committing spiritual heresy. You're saying, I don't really associate with the way that the Jewish people say you get to God anymore. I, I, I'm not able to keep the whole law. I'm not able to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm not able to keep the 600 and something odd numbered commandments that they had. I'm not able to do that. And so if you're a Jew in that culture and you say that, you're basically going to be ostracized by family, by friends. And it was a, a huge, huge, huge decision in their lives. And they had to make a decision. And, and that's why it says, in each of you be baptized. That baptism is not necessary for salvation. It, it's a proof of salvation. You're saying yes in front of all these other Jews. I'm going to be associated with Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. I believe in Jesus. And it cost him something. And it should cost you something. It cost Christ everything. But, but Christ never promises in the New Testament, he never promises that your life is going to be better somehow, that your life is going to be easier, that, that people are going to like you more. In fact, he says the opposite. He says, consider yourself blessed when you're persecuted. That's how you know you're in the faith. Consider yourself to, to, to being uh, you know, blessed for, for when people revile you and talk bad against you and, and do things that they wouldn't do to just anybody. But since you're a Christian, consider yourself blessed. You must have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can stop listening to me right now. If you don't know Christ is your Savior and the Holy Spirit is not in you, the rest of the message, it doesn't matter. It might be some good points, but, but ultimately, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, I'm serious, you can, you can leave. In the kindest way, if you're not open to, to, to what I'm about to say, if you're not open to, to the thought that you need repentance, you need Christ, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come in your life by faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's no point for the rest of the message. You're like, what's the rest of the message? Here it is. Number two, the Holy Spirit must have you. Okay? You must have the Holy Spirit... But the Holy Spirit must have you. What do I mean by that? Most people in here have have been in love at one point, I would assume. And and you can love somebody to death, right? You do 
You do everything you can for that person. You, you try your hardest to, to please that person. And, and man, you bring them flowers and, and you do whatever you can and, and you're in love. And, and man, they, they are just, they're the center of your world, right? They have your heart. But love is a two-way street, right? They have your heart, all right? But, but do they or do you have their heart? You see, you can love somebody and they not love you back. And it's true with the Holy Spirit, too. The Holy Spirit can be in you, but you cannot have the Holy Spirit in terms of the fulfilling of the Holy Spirit, the the, the overflowing of the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to have all of you. Though He indwells you, you can keep a little bit here, keep a little bit there. Holy Spirit, you can control my tongue, but my thoughts are another story. Holy Spirit, you can have, you know, my my money, but I don't really want to give to you, you know any other area in my life i'll just give and that kind of appeases my conscience and holy spirit you can have this but you can't have my food i like that too much holy spirit you you know you go back and forth about what the the holy spirit the holy spirit wants all of you though you have the holy spirit in you the holy spirit must have you how do we allow the holy spirit to have us how do we practically live this out there is a way and uh, you'll see on your paper it says W-A-Y, so we're going to go in succession here. But I want us to, to see a few verses that talk about this. Now, now, this is a practical step-by-step application of how to have the Holy Spirit. All right? This isn't the only thing. Uh, it's a combination of things as, as the Lord works in your life. But this is paramount in allowing the Holy Spirit to have you. And the first thing is walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 is on the screen. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? A lot of translations, maybe your translation will say live by the Holy Spirit. When I think about it, and when I was reading and and studying on it, I thought about this. Man, so-and-so lives for football. Man, so-and-so lives to eat. They love to go out and eat. Man, so-and-so lives for their spouse. You see, when you walk by the Spirit, you live for the Spirit. Daily, you're taking steps, moment by moment, to allow the Spirit to live through you. As you walk, you begin to just see that your life is not your own anymore. And you allow the Holy Spirit to have uh, whatever way He wants in your life. Romans 8, 5, it's not on the screen, just listen, it says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. This first part of Romans is not talking about the believer who's in the Spirit and the believer who is not in the Spirit. It's talking about a believer who has the Spirit of God in him and a person who does not at all have the Spirit of God because they're not a believer. So we've got a, we've got a distinction here. We've got two people. We've got a, a believer and an unbeliever. And it says that the, the believer, what he does to allow the Spirit of God to work in his life, he walks by the Spirit. That is, he lives by the Spirit. He makes the Spirit his priority. He makes the Spirit his practical daily objective. Spirit, Holy Spirit, work in me, use me in every situation, in every circumstance. Whereas the, the unbeliever goes throughout life. And guess what? He's got no shot. He doesn't even have an option to obey God. He doesn't even have, have a choice. Why? Because his flesh controls him. He might do some good things. He might do some good works. But it's all for nothing. It all amounts to nothing because it's not unto God. Because it's not done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8, 5 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. That is, the person who is not a Christian, the person that is not a believer, what do they think about? The majority of their thoughts are carnal. What do I mean by carnal? They're simply, they're about themselves. How they please themselves. But it goes on to say, but those who are according to the Spirit, what do they think about? They think about the things of the Spirit. Now the question is, what do you think about? What do you think about on a daily basis? What consumes your mind? There are some things that, that, are, that are just natural. You've got to think about your job. You've got to think about paying your water bill. You've got to think about you know, what to get your wife for Christmas. I'll take any suggestions. Um, you got to think about certain things, and those aren't necessarily wrong things, but the overall, overriding premise is this. What do you set your mind on? If you're an unbeliever, you set your mind on yourself, on the things of this world, on the things of your flesh. might not even always be bad, but your, your thought process has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit because it can't, because you don't have a relationship with God. 
But the believer sets his thoughts on the things of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, patience, mercy. All the things that, that God has, has wanted to say to us, He's said to us in His revealed Word. And so if you have the Spirit of God within you, you want to hear what the Spirit of God says, and you go to where the Spirit of God has spoken. Man, if you're not in this, there's no wonder you're not hearing from God. If you don't have a time where, where you get before God in His Word and in prayer, and you spend time with Him, His Spirit is powerless. He can't do anything in your life. He's got to have an avenue to, to, to talk to you and to speak to you and to prompt you. And that avenue is the Word of God and prayer with God. What do you set your mind on? This Christmas, is it about gifts? Is it about the tree? I mean, you know, is it about parties? What, what, is, what is your mind focused on? There should be some time this Christmas where you stop and, and you just, you, you're still and you, you come before God in His Word and in prayer and you allow the Spirit this Christmas to be involved in your life. He works through His Word. He works through prayer. That's why First Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. What a bold request. What a crazy request. How in the world can I pray without ceasing? I, I mean, seriously, that's, that's impossible. But it's commanded in Scripture. So how is it done? Well, it goes by, you walk in the Spirit. If you live in the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, that means that every thought that goes through your mind is processed through the Holy Spirit. Every thought that, that comes into your mind, uh, we take into to captivity that thought and we process it through what the Holy Spirit thinks and says. And how do we know what the Holy Spirit says and thinks? Back to it, right? Man, it comes back to the Word of God and that's how we have power in our lives. The Holy Spirit works in your life through the Word of God and through prayer. But if your mind is not set on those things, of course you won't pray without ceasing. You know, pray without ceasing simply means you're driving in the car and you think, I can't believe my wife said that. This is not a true story. I can't believe my wife did that. I can't believe so-and-so said that to me. And, and you take it in and, and, and real easy, if you're not living, if you're not walking in the Spirit, you can say, that person did me wrong. I'm going to get back at them. But a person who's walking in the Holy Spirit says... All right, what does the Word of God say about this situation? God, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I, I just don't know why this keeps happening. I don't know why I keep struggling with this. I don't know why, I, you know, this person has treated me this way. I don't know why this is happening. But I want to tell you, that's walking in the Holy Spirit. That's praying without ceasing. You're continually in a constant conversation that never really ends with God. It's like you picked up the phone when you got saved and you never hung up. You pray without ceasing, and, and the way we do that is the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives. It's walk, walking in the Spirit. The number, number two thing that I want us to see it's the way is acknowledge you have an obligation to the Holy Spirit. Acknowledge you have an obligation to the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 12 through 13 says this. I don't believe it's on the screen, so just listen. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh... To live according to the flesh. No, you're no, you're no longer that person anymore. You remember that? We talked about that. This person is not you anymore. You have, you're a new person in Christ. You have the Spirit of God in you. To live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He tells you you're under obligation. That might sound strange because a lot of times preachers will hammer this when you get saved. And you're free in Christ now. You have freedom like you've never known. And a lot of people will take that freedom and, and use it as a license to sin, but that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, no, 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 no. You're a slave. We don't like that word. Man, that word has bad, bad connotations to it. But he says, you're a slave now to Christ. You have an obligation. Listen to, listen to this. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it's on the screen. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? What? This is America, right? I'm my own person. I can be who I want to be. I'm going to express myself how I want to express myself. You can't tell me what to do. If you're a Christian, yes, God can. He can tell you exactly what to do, how to behave, how to act, why. The last part of the verse talks about that. It says, for you have been bought with a 
price. What's the price? The price is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's a high price. That God would come in the flesh. It's what we celebrate at Christmas, right? That God would come and wrap himself in flesh and humanity and skin and bones and all the weakness that is flesh. That he would do that for us. And that later he would go, like like the lamb in the Old Testament, he would be slaughtered. His blood would be shed for our sin. That's the price with which you were bought as a believer. Knowing that, (laughs) we should then want to give ourselves to the Spirit. I am so grateful for God for what you did for me that I want to serve you. It's not a burden. It's not a hassle. It's not a have to. It's I get to. Hallelujah, I get to serve him. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give myself to you. I'm going to acknowledge that I'm, I have an obligation to you to give myself to you. Acknowledge you have an obligation to the Holy Spirit. So we have walk by the Spirit or walk in the Spirit. Acknowledge you have an obligation to the Holy Spirit. If you don't acknowledge you have an obligation to the Holy Spirit, you'll never do what God wants you to do. If you don't understand that you are now a slave, the Bible says we are now friends with God, but you are also a slave to God. And that's the best type of slave because he has only good intentions for you. He has only good in mind for you. He has your best in mind and he knows as a master what is best and what is optimal for you and for your life. Walk in the Spirit. Acknowledge you have an obligation to the Holy Spirit. And lastly, yield yourself moment by moment to the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself moment by moment to the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, verses 12 and 13 says this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Him. What is it saying? The, the key word I want you to pick up on there is the word present. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. I, I brought in a present and all that kind of stuff. But, but I, thought about, I thought about Mike. Mike was in the military. How many, how many, of, you guys, how many of you guys and ladies, how, how many have been in the military? Wow. Thank you for your service. I want to use you as an illustration real quick. You think about that day when you showed up to boot camp and maybe you had some visions in your mind of what it was going to be like. Now, I've never been there, so I can't speak, but I've heard some pretty rough stuff. And, and, and I think about when you came off that bus or wherever you arrived from, you came in, you didn't know it, but you were presenting yourself to that officer. You were presenting yourself to someone. And by presenting, I mean you're saying, here I am. <laughs> I'm definitely not my own anymore. You mean you're going to take my hair? I'm going to have to wear glasses? You mean I have to wear that uniform and say, yes, sir? You know, you're presenting yourself. You're bringing yourself before them, not for the good of you, but for the good of the whole army, right? For the good of everyone, and you're presenting yourself before them, and you're saying, here I am, I'm presenting myself to you. Maybe it was, you know, not willingly once you found out what was really going on. But I believe that God wants us to present ourselves to him. Our bodies, our flesh, our minds, our spirits, everything that we are, we're to present our, ourselves to Him. We're to yield ourselves to Him. We're to give ourselves to Him on a daily basis. He goes back to that key phrase, you've got to give a life to get a life. Do you want that type of life? Do you want the type of life that, that, that God rewards? Do you want the type of life that's filled uh, with, with just extraordinary uh, miracles? I, I'm serious. I mean, we, we take for granted as, as Baptists that God can do miracles in our lives. We take for granted that God can do some, some amazing things. Half of the reason it doesn't happen is because we don't have the faith. And the other half of the reason is because we don't yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Do you want a life with meaning? with significance, with impact, with influence, with adventure, an abundant life. Christ said, I came so that they may have life and that they what? May have it more abundantly. God wants you to have a life that's just overflowing with power. A life that that is like the, the life that the Spirit brought at creation, at the incarnation and at the resurrection. Holy Spirit power to make you do things you never thought you could do and things you could never do in your own flesh. The Holy Spirit wants to do things through you, but we must yield ourselves moment by moment. What do I mean by yield? I just mean give up. A lot of people are here, maybe you're here today and you're just like, I just want to give up. 
And it's in the negative context. It's in the, I can't do this anymore. I, I've tried and, and things aren't working out for me. And I, I'm just done. I give up. God wants you to give up in the positive sense. Lord, I can't do it anymore. I don't have what it takes. Man, man I'm just I'm so done. I present myself to you. Would you use me? Because what I'm doing, it ain't working. Help me. In, empower me. Fill me with your spirit. Yield yourself. And it's a moment by moment thing. And that sounds, I mean, that, to, to many of you, that sounds like that's, that's crazy. I, I can't even imagine how much work that must take to yield yourself moment by moment by moment by moment. And, and you know, I have days where I go and, uh, and I'll have a good morning. And, and I'll, I'll be living for Christ and I'll yield myself to him. And then the afternoon, pff, just blow it. Just blow it. And I think, okay, well, I have a choice. I can spend the next couple hours or days continually to be my own and, and, and my life is my life, or I can go back moment by moment and, and, and say, God, I, I yield myself to you again. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me? And I yield myself to you. You see, it's a moment by moment thing. And it's like working out. You know, New Year's resolution, guilty. I'm going to start working out. I'm going to stop eating, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And and it's the same thing with, with your life, your spiritual life. Once you start doing it, it's very, very, very difficult at first. Very hard to work out, to get in that groove. But when you start doing it, everybody's been there. You feel better about yourself, don't you? Like, man, I have energy now. I, I, I can do this. This feels great. Why wasn't I doing this before? And, and then you relapse and you have a donut. <laughs> and then you're like, hmm. And you have a choice after that donut. Am I going to get back to eating healthy and working out? Moment by moment. Or am I going to say, you know what? I just want to continue to feed my flesh. It's the same thing spiritually. Do we moment by moment give ourselves to, to the Lord? Do we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit so he can have his way in us? Do you want a new life? Some of you are like, I'm fine. I'm not talking about contentment. Do you want a new life, a powerful life? One that's impactful. At the end of your life, on your deathbed, when you look back, do you want to be able to say, man, that was a powerful life. Thank you, God. I do. I think you do too. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? We talked about first that you need to know God. You have to have Him. You have to have the Holy Spirit within you. And maybe you don't. Maybe that's you today and you said, that, that's not me. And I need, to, I need to trust in Jesus Christ this morning. And I just want to lay it out there for you. It's, it's not by works of righteousness. It's simply by faith and trust in Jesus. And you can do that this morning. If that's you this morning, if you want to trust in Jesus Christ, would you just simply raise your hand? And I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you for that hand. Christian, I want to just speak to you for a moment. How are you doing with yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit? How are you doing with acknowledging that you have an obligation? How are you doing with walking, living moment by moment in the Spirit's power? Jesus said in John 6 44 no one can come to me unless the father who sent him draws me draws him and i will raise him up on the last day i want to tell you unbeliever that i'm not worried in terms of whether or not god can do what he says he can do if he's going to draw you he's going to draw you and some of your hearts are just stirring right now and you're fighting with god and you don't want to give and you don't want to give up you don't want to trust in jesus but the holy spirit is calling you to do that i want to tell you it's irresistible god is going to do it He's going to do it, and, and I know that, that you're struggling, Christian, maybe you're sitting there, and you're like, I want my life to be my life. I don't care what age you are. I don't care where you're at in life. I don't care what your circumstances. God wants to do an amazing thing in your life, but you have to be willing to give a life, to get a life. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, your truth, God, your goodness, your word. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit as believers, and we pray, Father, that we would not forget him this Christmas season or every day of our lives, God, but we would simply submit ourselves to him. We would yield ourselves to him. We would acknowledge that we have an obligation to him, Lord, and that we would walk by him. And Lord, I pray for believers here today and believers everywhere, God, that we would, that we would yield ourselves to, to the Spirit and that it would be a powerful life that we have because of it. If there's someone here today that doesn't know you, doesn't have the Spirit, God, may today be the day of salvation for them. What, a, what an amazing time, three days before Christmas, to say they can trust in Christ. I pray, God, that you would move in this place now. It's in Christ's name we pray.